Um, so good afternoon to everyone. It's great to have you all here. I'm Pamela Scott um, from the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, and we partner with the Office of International Programs and the Diversity and Inclusion Cabinet to bring you these workshop components of the cultural, I mean, the clinical cultural and diversity series. And this is the fourth component for this year. I would now like to introduce our special guest speaker. Dr. Jason E. Glenn joined KUMC's Department of History and Philosophy of Medicine in 2018. Prior to joining KUMC, he was the James Wade Rockwell Distinguished Professor in Medical History at the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston and a senior fellow at the Center to Eliminate Health Disparities, also at UTMB. He received his BA from Stanford University in 1996 and received both his Master's in Arts and his PhD in the History of Science and Medicine from Harvard University in 2001 and 2005 respectively. His areas of specialty include health inequities, the history of drug policy in the US, ethics and history of human subject research and deconstructing biological notions of race and discourse of genetic determination. Dr. Glenn is also the former director and founder of Sobriety High Incorporated, a nonprofit organization providing community reentry services for persons with histories of substance abuse who are returning home from incarceration. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Jason E. Glenn. Thank you so much for that introduction. And I thank you all for joining me here uh, this afternoon um, to share in this talk. And I, uh, I really hope you all find it informative. Um, dehumanization, colonialism, and the symbolic gaze in the production of biomedical knowledge. <clears throat> So I have a few objectives uh, for us this afternoon. One, I want to discuss the history of dehumanization in the production of biomedical knowledge within the transformation of the practice of medicine and what I'm calling the biomedicalization of life that takes place in the early 19th century. What the heck is that you ask, right? So the biomedicalization of life is the conceptual revolution of the 19th century that for the first time conceives of what it means to be human in biological terms. Um, for us, uh, thinking about humanity in this way now is so second nature, it's hard for us to imagine that there was a time that we thought about what it meant to be human in very different ways. Um, and prior to this point in human history, uh, all human societies thought about what it meant to be human in spiritual and religious terms. So this was a new way of thinking about what it meant to be human. It emerged uh, in the late, uh, the late uh, 18th century and early 19th century. Then I wanna reevaluate the dehumanized treatment that we've seen in both research and clinical care as a partial result of this shift and then so understand uh, the relevance of this legacy to contemporary challenges in both research ethics and health inequities. <clears throat> so that's a lot to try to get through. Um, so I start off with this quote um, that uh, you know, was gathered as part of research looking into the various uh, radiation experiments that took place on various US citizens uh, from the 1930s into the 1970s. <clears throat> and this was a radiologist, Leonard Sagan, who remarked that in 1945, 50, the doctor was king or queen. It never occurred to a doctor to ask for consent for anything. People say, oh, injection with plutonium. Why didn't the doctor tell the patient? Doctors weren't in the habit of telling patients anything. They were in charge and nobody questioned their authority. So I use that as a way of sort of illustrating <clears throat> sort of two balancing ways that we, that we need to confront when we think about 
the history of the production of biomedical knowledge. And any history of the production of biomedical knowledge needs to take into account two contradictory outcomes of the development of biomedicine. On the one hand, biomedicine has led to what Roy Porter, quoting Samuel Johnson, called the greatest benefit to mankind. And this is his award-winning book over here where he sings the praises of everything that has emerged out of biomedicine. On the other hand, biomedicine also laid the theoretical groundwork for and helped implement and oversaw one of the most systemic genocides in human history. <clears throat> the rise of, of biomedical research played a central role in the Nazi atrocities, but also led to the torture and death of tens of thousands of others in countless experiments carried out in many other Western nations, all in the pursuit of the production of biomedical knowledge. So to understand these two different trajectories, we must reconceptualize the advent of biomedical research beyond the canonical, uh, the canonical positivist narratives of modernity to instead see both as outcomes, as the logical, if half hidden, results of this epistemological shift toward the biocentric conception of what it means to be human. <clears throat> and this is what I'm calling that we're in right now, biocentric episteme. So like I said, it's late 18th, early 19th century, the point where man first becomes an object of study. And I put man in quotes there because man is not synonymous with all of humanity. It's a specific Western European conception of what it means to be human and defined at that point for as a purely biological being. It was represented within European circles and European scholarship as if it was a universal understanding of all of humanity. And that's still the legacy that we live with. Mm -hmm. During this time, the study of biology takes on special significance. Um, as the production of biomedical knowledge and the idea that there can be laws of biology for the first time become thinkable. And this is the period that Michel Foucault, a philosopher and historian of medicine, points to as the birth of the clinic, right? And this is where doctors are able to gain an exclusive knowledge of anatomical form and biological function through both dissection and microscopic examination, gazing into the open body, which allowed them to differentiate a normal body from a pathological body. <clears throat> Foucault's hypothesis is that this knowledge of biological function allowed doctors to match internal pathology to the specific clinical symptoms that uh, we see when patients present, right? And thereby develop a standardized nosology. And this is also how doctors were able to gain cultural authority. It's also important to remember that prior to this point, doctors weren't thought of as a prestigious profession. Um, it's only uh, in the aftermath of this where they, get, where they begin to gain a, a lot of increased cultural authority by defining the clinic as their scientific laboratory where biomedical knowledge is produced under their exclusive expertise. <laughs> This also leads to what Michel Foucault defined as the clinical gaze. <clears throat> and what is that? So for Foucault, um, the advent into the biocentric episteme um, led to uh, new epistemological, ontological, and technical reshapings of the way that doctors, per, uh, the way that medical professionals perceive um, people which he calls the clinical gaze. And this is focused at the molecular level and it reduces human existence to its biological process. So what it is essentially, it's a way of seeing outward signs of disease and imagining the internal pathology that is causing that, those, that illness. The gaze necessitated new objects of focus that could be open, explored and experimented upon to understand the biological laws that dictated how they work. 
Now, sc scholars in the history of medicine have traditionally pointed to the clinical gaze as the source of what became highly uh, commented upon um, in the 1960s as the impersonal and detached nature of the contemporary doctor-patient relationship. And that has been a continual critique lodged at the field of biomedicine um, for these five decades now. <clears throat> However, I want to put forth a different, a slightly different hypothesis, right? In terms of talk about what's missing from Foucault's analysis. And what's missing is actually the history of colonialism and how race plays into all of this. What is the relationship between the advent of human biology as a subject slash object of knowledge and the conceptualization of indigenous peoples and peoples of African descent as primitive slash dysgenic forms of biological expression, juxtaposed to the conceptualization of Europeans as an advanced eugenic form of biological expression. And, this be, and, and we have to ask these questions because this period of the late 18th and 19th century is the same period as the height of global European colonial expansion. Um, and it's also where race for the first time gets defined as a biological concept. Prior to this point, race had been thought of uh, within uh, European frames of thinking as a historical or, nat or natural rational concept. It had been thought of as a biological concept. So this is for the first time that race gets biologized at the height of European colonial expansion. And it's the same time where we start thinking of humans as strictly biological beings. And so in answering this question, uh, we also discover how biomedical research could lead to the two disparate outcomes as one, the greatest benefit of mankind, and also on the other hand, the thousands of atrocities in various forms of, biologic, uh, of biomedicines uh, mistreatment of various populations that have been. I also draw um, the writings of historian and philosopher uh, Georges Canguillem in his book, The Normal and the Pathological. And how Kengiam explains that a state is categorized as normal or pathological because humans attach positive or negative values to it. In the course of the 19th century, the real identity of normal and pathological vital phenomena became a kind of scientifically guaranteed dogma extended into the realms of, of philosophy and psychology. And so what does he mean by that, right? So what he's actually talking about is during this same shift into the biocentric episteme, it produced a mode of perception, not just specific to doctors, but by which to categorize all of human existence by imagining a biological cause to all human behavior, all social arrangements, and all social hierarchies. <clears throat> Uh-oh, I hit the wrong button. Um, with this insight, Right? We can therefore understand the shift to the biocentric episteme as one that entailed a totalizing mode of observation, right? one that's not exclusive to doctors, that gazes upon entire groups of people that were living in ways of life that were not Western and therefore perceived as foreign or primitive. Um, and then thinking about those entire groups of people as dysgenic as pathological deviations from the white Christian norm, and therefore as exploitable and expendable. Or as in the terms of the German doctors during the National Socialist period, life unworthy of life. So now let's get into the nitty gritty. Um, as we explained, uh, the advent of the biocentric episteme necessitated bodies for research. And it's important for us to realize that until the enactment, enactment of new regulations a little over 40 years ago, throughout the history of both research of anatomical form and then 
after that, biomedical research, the vast majority of subjects of study were persons either confined or institutionalized. And I mean people in prisons, uh, asylums, mental hospitals, and also those held as slaves. These institutionalized popula uh, populations were mentally ill, they were terminally ill, orphans were a favorite group, but the vast majority were prisoners. We can trace uh, some of this history back um, to uh, the age of anatomical exploration um, and Andreas Vesalius. Here on the left, we are all familiar with uh, one of the most famous pictures of the muscle men in Vesalius's De Fabrica. Um, and it was during this time that Vesalius sought to shirk off the confines of the dogma of Galenism and try to come up with a more scientific uh, study of anatomical form. But he used almost all executed prisoners. They were given to him uh, by the state uh, for his research. And it was because of their supposed moral transgressions that such bodies were deemed to no longer be deserving of the honor and dignity of a proper burial. Uh, most of us, because we can't read Latin, when we look at uh, Vesalius's De Fabrica, we look at the pictures. Um, but in the text, Vesalius and his artists actually uh, poke fun at how they secured the bodies that they used in order to do their drawings. And you can see it in a lot of the different block letters that begin the text um, in various uh, parts of the book. Here, what we see are a group of cherubs on the right-hand side who are lowering off the execution scaffolding. They're lowering a prisoner down uh, shortly after an execution to be taken to the Salius's lab for dissection. <clears throat> This became a common form of entertainment during the 1600s, uh, where, which is the period where scientific anatomy really blossomed. Thousands of people flocked to amphitheaters to watch human dissections. Um, and this was the utmost form of entertainment, um, as also it was the utmost form in shame and dishonor. Anatomy demonstrations offered a kind of macabre combination of curiosity, sex, and punishment. And the subjects were all executed prisoners. It's also important to remember here, this was during the humoral theory of medicine and illness, right? So it's not quite, uh, humans are not fully seen as biological objects yet. Um, so this is still within the humoral theory of medicine. But there was growing demand for medical schools and universities to provide more bodies as well. <clears throat> Britain passed the Murder Act in 1751 that actually forbid the burial of executed murderers and mandated that they be sent to the anatomist to be dissected in public. And then the Anatomy Act of 1832 broadened the category of those who were legitimately dissectable and dismemberable. <clears throat> During this time of slavery, um, Many slaves were used in the production of biomedical knowledge. Um, one uh, most famously, right, James Marion Sims, considered uh, one of the early pioneers of gynecological surgery and of gynecology in general. Uh, previous uh, generations, most gynecolo gynecological care was performed by midwives, who were mostly women. Um, and it is during this period that uh, biomedicine begins to take over that practice from midwifery. And we owe a lot of the early uh, successful interventions to the work of James Marion Sims. He was the one who developed the speculum as well as surgical forceps, but he really became famous for repairing vesicle vaginal fistulas, the ruptures that can occur um, in the birth canal between the urethra and the birth canal or between the anus and the birth canal during birth. He was con granted control of four uh, women who were being held as slaves as his research subjects um, in the late 1840s to perfect the technique, which had proved um, very difficult to suture uh, 
uh, because of infection. <clears throat> he subjected each woman to as many as 30 vaginal surgeries uh, in order to perfect his technique and didn't use any anesthesia. But all of us today are beneficiaries um, of this exploitation and abuse and the improvements that it made to the care, uh, to the gynecological care of women. In the post-emancipation shift, uh, black bodies in particular, both alive and dead, were used for experimentation and education throughout the 1800s and early 1900s. Specifically in the 1800s, medical schools competed for students by advertising their access to clinical material. Black bodies were systemically found on the dissecting tables and in the operating amphitheaters of medical schools. <clears throat> White students, as a matter of course, expected education and training based on the observation and detection um, and the experimental treatment of Black bodies. And there was a particularly huge demand for Black cadavers. They were usually executed prisoners, but not, all, uh, but not all the time. Sometimes they were stolen from graves. <clears throat> and if we go in the archives of any medical school in the United States, and we look around uh, this period of the late 1800s, early 1900s, you see many photographs that look like this. It was a rite of passage uh, for medical students um, to uh, take uh, and pose for photographs with their cadavers during gross anatomy instruction. And in those photographs, um, there are certain tropes that we see usually always present. One um, is uh, being posed with a skeleton. Mm -hmm. um, another is the actual cadaver in various uh, states of dismemberment. Um, and sometimes too, also the porter um, or the janitorial staff who was responsible for cleaning up the anatomy lab, and that's the black gentleman here seated on the bucket at the bottom. But in these photographs, we can often see um, the melanated skin of the cadavers, and we know uh, and we can look based on all those photographs how often and how common the use of black bodies were for this purpose. <clears throat> also in a lot of these, there's uh, often a chalkboard with uh, some witty little epithets written on them, a martyr to science, he lived for others and died for us. So it's basically sort of expressing this very idea that it is due to the exploitation of these bodies that we are able to gain the knowledge in order to be proficient in our field. The 20th century sort of brings us to uh, sort of the classic era of human experimentation. And we can break those down into an uh, early phase, which is pre-World War II, where there are dozens of less formalized research studies that were conducted, usually investigating the causes and vectors uh, and trans of vectors of transmission of infectious diseases. The emphasis on those um, that most heavily impacted U.S. shipping commerce and also U.S. colonial military efforts. The subjects were nearly all U.S. prisoners and prisoners held in various other U.S. colonies. <clears throat> An example, uh, and this is just, I just pulled out examples to kind of give us really those that set the template. Um, one was an early study in the Philippines. Philippines was acquired as a U.S. colony as a result of the Spanish-American War. There, a military doctor set out uh, to study some of the diseases that were most impacting uh, colonial shipping commerce. One of those was a very, very study that was conducted by Dr. Richard Strong um, in the first decade. He was a first lieutenant in the army and appointed in 1901 to investigate tropic diseases. As was the case, there were a lot of illnesses that were initially thought to be infectious diseases, and beriberi was one of them. And the early research that built the knowledge uh, to learn that they were actually nutritional deficiencies um, was done on a lot of prisoners and sometimes orphans. Mm -hmm. The extreme uh, cases of the disease can cause paralysis and even heart failure. 
researchers began to suspect that it might not be an infectious disease because correctional staff weren't coming down with it, only the prisoners. Mm -hmm. So they withheld proper nutrition from 29 prisoners in order uh, to induce the illness. And of course, the prisoners experienced um, not just um, the effects of beriberi, but sometimes while they're trying to narrow down what specific type of nutritional deficiency um, it was, withholding other nutritional foods can cause various other illnesses. So the prisoner suffered from all kinds of ailments as a result. Inspired by this research though, um, US public health researchers back here on the home front um, tried to, were also trying to discern uh, the cause of pellagra. Um, that was also thought to be an infectious disease. By the early 1900s, pellagra had become an epidemic, uh, particularly in the American South. Um, nearly outbreaks saw over 100,000 people infected with it. And in 1915, there were 1,300 deaths in South Carolina alone from pellagra. But inspired by the beriberi studies in the Philippines, um, researchers uh, of the U.S. Public Health Service <clears throat> used inmates and subjected them to extreme malnourishment to induce the illness. The subjects were mostly black because the Mississippi prison system, um, which uh, really began to sprout um, after uh, the emancipation of slaves, um, their prison system was mostly black. Mm -hmm. And so their exploita exploitation led to the understanding of pellagra as an illness caused by niacin deficiency. Out in California, uh, there were a series of testicular transplant experiments that were conducted uh, by Dr. Leo Stanley, who was the chief surgeon there at the prison. Um, he was inspired by various eugenic theories that hypothesized that many illnesses were ultimately related to the vitality of the gonads. So he removed the testicles from, do from goats, lambs, and also executed younger prisoners to surgically implant them into some of the older prisoners there. Um, <clears throat> he imagined um, that doing so might be a cure for crime and senility. <clears throat> the extracted testicles were either inserted into the abdominal wall or into the scrotum of the prisoner um, and he was undeterred by early negative uh, results that were killing some of his subjects. And the studies were actually allowed to continue for over eight years until they were shut down. Orphans were another favored group uh, upon which to conduct research during this time. Um, the, uh, the picture below is the Asylum for Colored Orphans in uh, New York. Uh, 1861, and yes, orphanages were segregated in the U.S. like all other institutions. <clears throat> um, and this was especially true, they were especially popular for researchers studying venereal diseases. Uh, there are, from this period, there are more than 40 published studies where children were purposefully infected with gonorrhea and syphilis, um, including studies where gonorrheal cultures were swabbed directly into the children's eyes. <clears throat> in uh, the first decade of the 1900s, researchers infected dozens of children uh, with uh, tuberculosis at an orphanage in Philadelphia to test possible cures. And even military researchers uh, got in the mix. Walter Reed with George Miller Sternberg conducted smallpox immunity studies on children uh, in Brooklyn orphanages before uh, he went on uh, famously turning, uh, turning his attention to yellow fever. The field of cancer research um, owes also a huge, uh, a huge debt to research that was done early on on prisoners that were held in another American colony, uh, colony of Puerto Rico. There, Dr. Cornelius Rhodes, who was a pathologist from the Rockefeller Institute, um, used prisoners in Puerto Rico for a number of different studies, the most heinous of which was to test whether or not cancer could be spread by direct injection of malignant cells. 
into a non-cancerous patient or person. <clears throat> His early research there in Puerto Rico made him the premier cancer researcher of his era. Uh, he purposefully hid details of the experiment uh, from the subjects, and we know that at least 13 of the subjects died from his early study there. We also have uh, some historical archive evidence of his inspiration. In a letter that was leaked to the Puerto Rican Nationalist Party, Rhodes wrote that the Puerto Ricans are beyond doubt the dirtiest, laziest, most degenerate and thievish race of men ever inhabiting this sphere. It makes you sick to inhabit the same island with them. What the island needs is not public health work, but a tidal wave or something to totally exterminate the population. It might then be livable. I've done my best to further the process of extermination by killing off eight and transplanting cancer into several more. The latter has not resulted in any fatality so far. The matter of consideration of the patient's welfare plays no role here. In fact, all physicians take delight in the use of torture of the unfortunate subjects. <clears throat> this was particularly egregious, um, and uh, it really shows the process of dehumanization uh, in really stark terms. I do not think, you know, with most researchers of this era, that their genocidal desires were um, as explicit as with Rhodes. Uh, with most of them, it was sort of a, a general idea that these people have less human value and because they have less human value, they can be used in a way that may be valuable to the rest of us who have more human value. Um, but this really shows you the extremes to which some of them did perceive what they were doing. <clears throat> But as a result of his work, Rhodes got promoted. And when he, upon return to New York, was allowed to continue his job at the Rockefeller Institute, despite that letter being made public uh, when it was leaked, he was hired as vice president of the New York Academy of Medicine. And then during World War II, rejoined the military, promoted as colonel in the army and chief medical officer of the Chemical Warfare Division. Uh, as such, he established chemical weapons laboratories uh, for the army in various states, uh, as well as all the way down in Panama, where he oversaw the testing of poison gas on over 60,000 U.S. service members, many of them Puerto Ricans who had joined uh, the armed services in order to try, try to prove um, their patriotism to the U.S. so they could be treated as full citizens. <clears throat> so uh, obviously the subject suffered the horrific effects of the nerve gas, uh, but for his work, he was awarded the, merit, the, uh, the Legion of Merit in 1945. He was also um, <clears throat> then named director of the newly initiated Sloan Kittering Institute after World War II, where he began conducting various chemotherapy and radiation experiments for the US Department of Energy. When we think of the vast uh, system of radiation experiments in the US during this era, uh, they included many different things, including removing the bodies from graveyards to test them for background radiation in the atmosphere, irradiating the heads of children as a treatment for hookworm. And uh, if any of you have ever seen, there's a documentary out uh, it's called Hole in the Head, uh, and it tells a story of one of these children who had, who received total head radiation, um, who surprisingly, you know, grew to old age, lived to, I think, his late 60s or 70s, but had a, a very grotesque uh, hole in his head for his entire life that he was constantly trying to hide. Um, also feeding radioactive material to mentally disabled children, uh, exposing U.S. soldiers to high levels of radiation, um, sending res uh, military researchers to Hiroshima to assess damage after American had dropped the atom bomb there, and irradiating the testicles of prisoners um, <clears throat> or giving lethal doses of radiation to cancer patients under the guise of treatment. <clears throat> 
The cancer patients were mostly selected from U.S. public hospitals, um, including uh, UC San Francisco, UC Berkeley, Iowa, Massachusetts, UCB, and Cincinnati General Hospital. Um, the hospitals had a secret contract with the military. They did not inform the patients that they were uh, being used um, for the testing of various doses of radiation. And so because these were a lot of public hospitals, many of their patients were poor. They were often black um, and not all of them were terminally ill. Most of them were irradiated during an early stage of their cancer, um, where if it was, if they were given uh, perhaps a therapeutic dose, they may have actually um, received a benefit from it. The subjects were told they were being treated for their cancer. <clears throat> Some subjects were given total body radiation in a massive dose to simulate that of uh, a nuclear war. This military grade level of radiation had no possibility of, include, of improving the subject's health and the researchers at the time knew that. There were thousands of patients in all, but the exact numbers are unknown. Um, and they, of, of course, many of the patients suffered from acute radiation sickness. And it's estimated that 25% died within one month as a result of their radiation exposure. All of this has been well documented um, during the congressional hearings into the radiation studies uh, that were done during the 90s, uh, during the Clinton administration, and it's all online um, if you ever wanna sort through uh, some of it. <clears throat> it's painstaking work, but it is, it's horrific. Many of us know about the US Public Health Service study at Tuskegee, but many of us uh, don't know about a similar U.S. Public Health Service study that took place in Guatemala. <clears throat> there, U.S. Public Health researchers intentionally infected 1,700 Guatemalan prisoners and mental institution patients with syphilis and other STDs in order to test efficacy of penicillin. And they were, they felt a certain amount of urgency about it because um, venereal diseases were sidelining a lot of American soldiers during the effort. Uh, venereal diseases often sidelined a lot of soldiers because uh, in the histories of war, as we all know, soldiers not only frequented prostitutes, but also did a lot of raping. Um, the US Public Health Service uh, researchers hired prostitutes for this study. They infected them with syphilis and then forced them to have sex with prisoners and patients in the mental institutions. And if a syphilitic infection didn't occur, quote, naturally, uh, they gave the men and women abrasions on their genitalia and then forced them to have sex again. And if that still didn't work, the men were given syphilis by spinal injection. <clears throat> It was conducted uh, during the war, war years by many of the same personnel who were also conducting the Tuskegee syphilis study. The Tuskegee syphilis study started in 1972, and did, I mean in 1932, and did not end until 1972. Um, it was co-sponsored by pub, U.S. Public Health Service, the NIH, Pan American Health Sanitary Bureau, um, and the Guatemalan government. The U.S. got the Guatemalan government to buy into it with the promise that they would provide them penicillin um, after the study was done uh, for use and uh, in, in to dis distribute for their own population. And the study ended in 1948 when they proved definitively that penicillin was a cure for syphilis. And now mark that, right? So they proved definitively that penicillin was a cure for syphilis it began to be deployed throughout military personnel, but the Tuskegee syphilis study was allowed to continue with the men being untreated up until 1972. The war period leads us to discuss um, what was happening uh, globally. Um, when we think about really egregious, exploitative and abusive uh, research practices in the production of biomedical knowledge, Germans have become the poster children for it. Um, 
During this period, German researchers uh, performed a number of hypothermia studies, high altitude studies, um, sterilization studies, uh, 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 poisonous gas studies, and vaccination trials for malaria and typhus, all conducted on prisoners. And you look at that list and you say, that doesn't sound any more egregious than what US researchers were doing. And it wasn't just something that US researchers and German researchers, it was a game the whole world could play. Um, Britain conducted chemical warfare studies on over 20,000 British soldiers and later then Indian colonial subjects in the 1930s through 1950s at their Port and Down testing facility. Canada tested tuberculosis vaccines on over 600 indigenous children that had been kidnapped and forcibly removed from their homes and their families as part of their westernization efforts with their indigenous populations. And then during World War II, they conducted additional studies with uh, the same group of children who'd been forcibly removed from their homes, um, where they were purposefully malnourished in order to test uh, the dietary supplements that were being given or that they wanted to give to soldiers out in the field. In the 1930s and 40s, the Russians were testing mustard gas, ricin, digitoxin, and K2 um, as a odorless um, and traceless uh, drug uh, to be used for assassination. Japan likewise used tens of thousands of uniform prisoners for biological warfare research, mostly in Manchuria and China, uh, beginning in 1930 at dozens of secret bases scattered throughout um, their colonial uh, territories at the time. And uh, at the close of the war, they, they killed nearly all of their test subjects before abandoning those bases. <clears throat> and nevertheless, despite these widespread practices throughout the Western world, um, it was only Germans that were put on trial for these types of practices during the Nuremberg trial in the aftermath of World War II. It was a group of 24 uh, German doctors <clears throat> who were put on trial for their crimes against humanity. Um, and of particular concern were their human um, subject experiments. And as a result, we got the Nuremberg, the Nuremberg Code. <laughs> and interestingly enough, the first tenant of the Nuremberg Code, um, which I have posted here, right, um, is all about forbidding the experimentation on someone who is not free to consent or to say no. Right, um, and be so socially positioned to as have the power to consent and say no. So this by itself, the very first tenet of the Nuremberg Code, which we use um, to convict uh, the 24 Germans who were on trial, um, in which eight of them were hanged, um, directly forbade the use of prisoners for the production of biomedical knowledge. <clears throat> We continue uh, some of the other tenets. Um, the experiment should be conducted to avoid all unnecessary physical and mental suffering. No experiment should be conducted where there's an a priori reason to believe that death, death or disabling injury will occur. Should be conducted by scientifically qualified persons. Um, and during it, the person should have the ability uh, to call the experiment to an end. Um, <clears throat> Now, the German doctor cited US research practices in their defense, um, and but despite doing so, um, or seven were sentenced to death by hanging and the others to long prison terms. But here's what's important, that in the face of the Nuremberg trials and sentencing, egregious US research practices actually expanded in the aftermath of World War II um, and got worse as government sponsorship increased. <clears throat> One of the worst was a series of experiments uh, trying to discern uh, the, 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 the causing vectors of hepatitis with a group of orphans held at the Willowbrook State Mental Hospital. There, Dr. Saul Krugman fed fecal matter to mentally disabled children. Um, 
the fecal matter he mixed with their chocolate milk and fed it to them for 15 years. He started very gingerly, only putting a little bit in there, but over the years, he worked his way up to about 20% uh, was fecal matter, um, and the other 80% was chocolate milk. And he claimed the conditions of the school were so filthy that the children would catch hepatitis anyway. That's partially true. The conditions at the school, um, as at many orphanages, particularly for disabled children at the time, were horrendous. But as a medical researcher, his first impulse should have been to improve the conditions, not exploit the conditions uh, for the production of knowledge. In 1950s, um, this is a picture of Holmesburg Prison in Philadelphia. And there during this time, Holmesburg Prison became the premier training ground for medical students and residents in dermatology. By the late 1960s, it was the largest and best known in the country. And it made UPenn the National Center for Dermatology Studies and Education. It's still one of the best dermatology programs in the country to this day. There they did expansive phase one testing of pharmaceutical and commercial products. Prisoners were subjected um, not just to basic things like, you know, lotions and deodorants, but as the years progressed, they were subjected to things like radioactive isotopes, dioxin, hallucinogenic and capacitance, various other chemical warfare, viral and cancer studies as well. The height of this we probably see with uh, what started as some drug and plasma experiments um, of Austin Stowe, um, who began his career um, as a part-time physician at Oklahoma State Penitentiary in 1939. But in the aftermath of World War II, he started a business extracting blood, uh, both blood and blood plasma from inmates in order to meet the growing plasma demand nationally. In selling blood products, he also realized that, hey, there's a market here for some phase one, uh, phase two drug testing as well. There, uh, after he started, he expanded partnerships with uh, both the Arkansas and Alabama state prison systems to be able to test on more prisoners. He enrolled thousands of inmates in phase two drug studies, paying them a dollar a day for their participation. This is one of the issues that we uh, point to today as we realize that this is a form of coercion. We think a dollar a day may not sound like much, but when you are a person who is not free, a dollar a day can be a course of amount. He conducted over 130 drug trials for many different drug companies, including Wyeth, Bristol Myers, Squibb, Merck, et cetera. <clears throat> um, he uh, not only were, continued to conduct biomedical studies, but also continue to extract and sell their blood and their plasma as the studies continued. He was earning nearly a million dollars a year um, at the height. And by 1969, it was estimated that Stowe's research accounted for 25 to 50% of all phase two drug testing in the United States. Hepatitis outbreaks were common and many prisoners died very slow, painful deaths of end-stage liver, liver disease, but the exact numbers are, um, have been concealed. Um, the Stowe family enterprises have, uh, are still around today. They've divested into both real estate holdings um, and as well as your plasma centers that are you know, dotted around various cities in the country. Plasma centers still depend on the exploitation of very poor people who can come in and donate plasma for 50 bucks and use that 50 bucks to pay for groceries, gas, or whatever. Um, if you ever visit one of those plasma centers, you will see that the people there aren't uh, your middle class or upper class Americans. There are, they're all people who are working class or living on the margins. <clears throat> and it's the millions that he made off prisoners that helped grow that enterprise. So as we wrap up, um, there was reform during the civil rights era. Um, it did not uh, completely fix the situation, um, but the reforms were significant. Um, 
and they came after uh, the spirit of the day caused a number of whistleblowing articles to come out about um, not only exposing Stowe's research, but the radiation experiments in 1971, the Tuskegee uh, syphilis study in 1972, um, and it caused uh, Congress uh, to create the, uh, the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects in 1973, which finally resulted in the Code of Federal Regulations. <clears throat> that really changed the laws around the exploitation and abuse of the most vulnerable populations in the US. However, there remained uh, the exploitation and abuse of very vulnerable populations in an international sense. And in, in, in that respect, uh, we still have long ways to go. So I draw us back to the symbolic gaze. And what do I mean by the symbolic gaze? as opposed to the clinical gaze. And what I mean by that is that we can understand Foucault's concept of the clinical gaze in more general terms, right? That this is not a gaze specific to doctors, um, but a symbolic gaze specific to this 19th century conception of what it means to be human as a purely, purely biological being. Um, and through that conception, Categorizes different groups of human humans as having different biological values. So it is in it is through the lens of the symbolic gaze that the bodies of prisoners, um, etc., were classified as legitimately exploitable biological objects for study, producing the impersonal detachment of the biomedical investigator. And so we say, what effects? Um, have these research practices had on the knowledge produced. It led to a biomedical corpus of knowledge that has been detached from greater understanding of humans as primarily social symbolic and not only biological beings. So this is not to deny that human biology exists or that humans have a biology. However, it is to insist that in terms of how we live and experience our biology and how we conduct our lives, how we organize our societies, that is primarily a social symbolic function, right? And in other words, as humans, our behaviors are motivated and framed by the symbolic structures and cultural narratives and discourses rather than only biological imperatives. And this is especially important for understanding the social and structural determinants of health, as well as um, how we understand the history of the ethics of the research practices that have produced the biomedical knowledge that we now have. In closing, the shift to the biocentric episteme with its analogous totalizing mode of perception, which categorize normal humanity um, in distinction from it's pathological, biologically disselected others. And I'm talking about um, those who were categorized as primitives, as natives, um, and those who were made into slaves was made thinkable, not only uh, made thinkable, not only biology as a scientific discipline, but also the idea that groups of people could be dysgenic, useless, and therefore legitimately abused and exploited for the production of biomedical knowledge. Nearly all of the biomedical breakthroughs that we enjoy today can trace many of their roots back to this history of abuse and exploitation of populations who have been dehumanized through the symbolic gaze of Western man. So um, I, in, in closing, I want us all to begin thinking about how do we repair the harms from this legacy? Right. Um, this is a legacy that we've all inherited, that we all continue to benefit from now, um, not all to the same degree. Uh, some of us continue to be harmed by this legacy, um, while some of us enjoy those benefits. Um, but it is a legacy that we inherit, and we need to start asking ourselves a question about how do we repair the harms of this legacy. So thank you very much. Um, we have.
I guess, uh, only a couple minutes for questions. But if there's any, um, you all can um, ask me. I apologize, I can't stick around for very long. I have a student's MPH thesis defense that I have to run to in like a couple minutes, but I'll take one question if there is one. Yeah, there's a question in the chat that was submitted. Um, how can reparations be made for the profit made off of human beings? Great question. Um, and the, the way that reparations can be made is by really investing in the communities that have suffered the most from these centuries of abuse and exploitation. Um, in our country, we've really divested a lot from our most vulnerable com communities. We divested uh, and most of our money gets put into foreign military and colonial endeavors. That's still the case. And we as a society, we have to decide, right? That do we want the bulk of our resources to go toward continue military endeavors or do we want the bulk of our resources to be invested in us as people, as communities? The wealth that has been generated here, um, you know, now we're really squandering. That wealth is being squandered when it needs to be really invested in the communities that need it most. Um, that's a short answer, short and sweet, um, but I have to run and get to my students' uh, uh, master's thesis defense. I thank you all so much uh, for joining me um, and feel free, if there are any further questions, feel free to email me. I'll answer them later this afternoon. All thank right. you so much, Dr. Glenn. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Okay. Thank you.